page sheet. And so uh, raise, raise your hand and you can look. If you haven't gotten the one page sheet, we're going to discuss that right away, but we're going to discuss these scenarios in a little bit. So we're going to talk about ethics and the unethical practices of attorneys in New Mexico that have to do with land grants. Um, so to have a context for a, a particular series of problems that happen with land grants, um, we have to know a little bit about the partition statute and a little bit about um, how, how the partition statute came to affect land grants. And so, next slide, please. So, this great artwork is, uh, is a land grant. And the green strips are, uh, are Aseca irrigated lands, and the little toy houses are houses. And the rest of everything that's not green, or everything that's not a house, is the common lands of the land grant. And so we all have a pretty good idea of what common lands are, but let's compare it to the next slide. So some land grants got confirmed by the federal government as a tenancy in common. Okay, a tenancy in common looks very similar, except that the common lands, um, let's say that there's 46 original uh, grantees of this particular land grant, in a tenancy in common situation, everything that's not green or that's not a house is owned by 46 identifiable individuals, each of whom own 1 46th of that unallotted land. So you might say, well, what's the difference? Isn't, isn't that similar to common lands? Isn't that similar to the previous slide? Well, here's, here's the difference. The difference is, uh, one major difference is the application of the partition statute. Next slide, please. So the partition statute was passed in 1876. Um, it's a suit that can only take place if the land is a tenancy in common. And the plaintiff must be one of the co-tenants. So the plaintiff is suing, filing a lawsuit called a partition suit, and is trying to extract his or her share, his or her, her 146 share, out of the total undivided. Um, go back one slide, please, if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, notice the word undivided. So when, when you see the word undivided, uh, someone says, I have an undivided, it's usually accompanied by a fraction. I have an undivided 40% share. I have an undivided 1 tenth share. That means it's mixed in, that there isn't, you haven't divided the common lands up into 46 discrete pieces, but all the shares are mixed together. That's what a tenancy in common is. Next slide, uh, back to the partition set. So what the plaintiff is trying to do is say, I don't like having my share mixed in with everyone else. I, wanna, I want my share to myself. And that's what the partition statute is supposed to do. Now, um, going over to the right-hand side, you can see some interesting things. Uh, see this unknown persons made parties? Um, that, that's a common thing in lawsuits, um, but it was abused a lot in the land grant adjudication period. What that means is that you, uh, you're supposed to make an honest effort to find out who the other co-owners are and serve them to be defendants if you're, if you're the plaintiff in a partition suit. Um, but if you don't know where they are or who they are, you can um, add to the end, you can say, these are the defendants and also all known, unknown persons. What a lot of people did was they took shortcuts and they didn't do their due diligence and find out who the other co-tenants were and that was a way of not giving notice to people because those people would never get served and they would never know that the lawsuit was taking place. So this statute, like many statutes, allows you to do that. Um, now this is an interesting thing, it says finding that property can't be partitioned well, isn't that good? If it can't be partitioned, then maybe, maybe the partition statute isn't that destructive. What that means, though, is finding that the property cannot be divided into 46 equal pieces. And if the, if the person that's appointed, the commissioners that are appointed to oversee this partition suit, find that the property can't be divided, cut up into 46 equal pieces, then they can order a sale of the entire uh, amount of land held in common. 
and the pro and then everyone gets proceeds, and that's the result of the partition suit. So going back to the left side, the usual result of the partition sale is the whole is the sale of the whole piece of land held in common in the division of the proceeds. So the, the craziest thing about this, there's a lot of crazy things in property law. I, I think adverse possession is a crazy thing, that you can squat on someone's land and in 10 years it's your land. That's crazy. But this is crazy too. The plaintiff in a partition suit doesn't have to get the consent of any of the other co-tenants to file a partition suit. So the land can get sold out from under everyone else, all the other 45 people. <laughs> by the action of one person who wants to extract their share of it. And that's the usual result of a partition suit. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. Um, you might say, why should there even be a partition law? Well, the classic example of a, of a possibly useful use of a partition law that people cite to is usually family land. Uh, both parents have died, there's four kids, it doesn't usually end in partition. Usually when there's four kids and each kid has an undivided one-fourth interest, meaning it's all mixed together um, in the property, usually they find a way to buy out the person who doesn't want it or um, that kind of thing. But if the siblings are not able to buy out the people who don't want to have anything to do with the property, then one of the siblings would have the right to file a partition suit and that's where you often see partition suits. Partition suits were never really meant to apply to land grants, but they did. Um, the law didn't make any distinction. It said any tenancy in common. So next slide, please. Um, so someone asked earlier, I can't remember if the gentleman's still here, said, um, you know, asked about why there were partition suits or something like that. And I gave the answer, the reason is because there was a mistake that was made when it was confirmed by the federal government. It should never have been confirmed as a tenancy in common. If you have true common lands, it can't be partitioned because you don't have people with fractional undivided shares. You have a common lands that's owned by the community, by the land grant as a corporate entity. Um, that's very different. Um, and those, these two principles don't mix and match, really. Uh, in other words, like, um, if there's 100 people in a city and there's a, and the, and there's a park, um, you don't hear people say, I own one one-hundredth of the park. Well, it's, that's not how it is, because the city owns the park and it's corporate entity. It's the city's property. It's not my property as a resident. And that's how every, every land grant should have gotten confirmed as a land grant with two common lands, but a disturbingly high number of them got confirmed as tenancies in common. So that opened the, paved the way for any heir to file a partition suit and cause the sale of the, of the land grant as a result of the partition suit. Um, So obviously the effect of the, of the partition suit is to basically strip all the white off the land grant and leave them with only the green. So that's all, it's all the community was left with and the, and the white all got sold uh, at an auction as part of the um, proceeding. Excuse me just a second. <clears throat> So, what does this have to do with attorney misconduct, okay? Um, when, uh, what reasons did land grants have, anyone, to hire attorneys? What reasons did land grants have to hire attorneys? Protect themselves, try to keep the land. Try to keep the land, okay. That's the right answer, but more specifically, in the confirmation process. Remember this morning, uh, Manuel and, and Jacobo talked about there were two confirmation processes, the Surveyor General, the Court of Private Land Claims, and you needed an attorney to deal with those federal entities in order to get confirmation of your land. So you think the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo protected your land automatically, it didn't work that way. You actually had to, um, the Congress passed lands to execute the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and you had to follow the statutes 
that they passed that said this is how you confirm your land grant. So that's why attorneys got hired. Um, how were attorneys paid? With land. Why? No había dinero. Right. Um, so, um, if a um, if an attorney was hired and got paid in land, and next slide, please, um, and happened to uh, negotiate a 40% undivided share of the land, then this is what you have. You have an attorney with a 40% undivided share, meaning mixed in with everyone else's, and 46 co-owners, each with a 146 undivided share of the remaining 60%. What has the attorney become? The attorney has become a co-tenant, has become part of the co-tenancy has become a 47th co-tenant. And what does the attorney have the right to do with the share? Partition. Partition, not sell. Partition, right? Any co-tenant can file a partition suit, no matter what amount of share they have. And so the attorney um, would have had the right to do that. Um, I should mention, that, um, going back one slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Going forward, or going back one more slide. There we go. That um, most of the time when unknown persons were made parties, um, you were allowed to, the statute allowed you to um, publish notice to the unknown parties in the newspaper. So oftentimes, the only notice of a partition suit was in the legal section of an English language newspaper that said, if you're an unknown claimant to the such and such land grant, uh, a suit has been filed and you can come forward and participate if you want. So there was a serious problem up until the early part of the 20th century when the courts did something about it. There's a serious problem in partition suits with people not knowing the partition suit would even happen, was even happening. So that whether it was a lawyer who filed the partition suit, you could go, go ahead to that um, next one. Yeah. Whether it was a lawyer that filed the partition suit to get money for his or her 40% share, or whether it was one of the other co-owners that filed it, there was usually a problem with the, the vast majority or all the whole community not even knowing that this was happening. Not participating in it and not even knowing that it was happening. Um, okay, so. Um, so we are going to go to the next slide. And we're gonna do what happens in these CLEs a lot, which is there's a fictitious, well this one actually is not fictitious. There's a, a number one on your one page sheet that you have, why doesn't anyone take a minute and read that? And the question you'll be asking yourselves as you read it is, was there any misconduct or unethical practices on the part of any of the lawyers? This really happened. David, I, I may have missed something, you know, at, at some point, but the instructions that were issued by the Observer General in 1854-55, you know, which were published in the Santa Fe, New Mexican, uh, I don't remember anything saying that it required an attorney to file a claim. I'm pretty sure it wasn't required. I think so, that. Uh, I don't know. What I'm curious about is why did everybody file attorneys when some. Okay, anyway. Isn't that a great question? Why did people hire attorneys to confirm their land grants? <laughs> In hindsight, that's a good question, but I think at the time they thought, gee, an attorney is going to help me. Okay. So, uh, who, uh, is there anything, 
And this is just a joke of a question. Is there anything wrong with anything that the attorneys did in number one here? Anyone? Anyone? What, what's one thing that one attorney did wrong in this scenario here, number one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yes, there's a very obvious one, bribery. Okay, and let's talk about that for a second, because in a, an attorney can do something wrong, and it can be, there are different kinds of wrongs. You can commit a crime, you can commit something that is a civil offense, or you can violate um, the ethical rules. And there's other, other bad things you can do too, but those are the three main ones, right? So if you commit a crime, you get prosecuted and you can do jail time. And I would say bribery is very possibly a crime. Um, and, but also, believe it or not, it's in, it's in the code of ethics that, uh, that, oh gosh, I'm sure it has something to do with uh, improper contact with a judicial officer. Uh, I, I forget, I can't cite the exact rule, but yeah, some things are both a crime and an ethical, um, an ethical wrong. Uh, another example of something that was done wrong. There's just so many in this one. Anyone? Yes? <laughs> there you go. A.B. Renahan represented the company who was uh, trying to quiet title to the common lands, and then he also came to represent um, some of the individuals. In other words, he was representing both the buyer and the seller in the same lawsuit. That's a bit of a conflict of interest. Okay, so these are very obvious. Um, this, again, this happened, this all happened to the Las Trampas grant, and it's one reason that the Las Trampas grant, you know, looks the way that it does now instead of, have, not, instead of having its common lands intact, and instead of having more, uh, more land for the communities, um, because there were some issues about um, under undercounting the amount of land that belonged to the different communities, um, but let's look at number. Let's look at number two. And number two is just much more common, and it doesn't have as many dramatic things like bribery and um, representing both sides of a lawsuit, which are very obvious ethical problems. Take a minute and read number two. Okay, so let's delve into this a little bit. <clears throat> the first thing that I think of when I read this is, um, go back if you can, uh, Lauren, to um, number five. Thank you. Is when this lawyer first got hired, was the lawyer telling them do you want to be confirmed as this or as this? Because they ended up with this. But does a lawyer have any duty to tell the, to inform their clients how to achieve their objectives that they hired the lawyer for? And the answer is yes, the lawyer does. So the fact that it ended up this way instead of this way, and therefore subject to partition, is a problem right at the outset. Let's go to slide um, eight. So these are some rules that have to do with communication and advising your client. Hey, are those legible to people in the back? Can you read that? Not really, okay. So um, these numbers are the, the, rule, the rules of professional conduct for New Mexico, the present day rules of professional conduct. So 16104 deals with communication. A lawyer shall reason, shall, not may, shall reasonably consult with the client about the means by which the client's objectives are to be accomplished. And going down further, a lawyer shall explain a matter to the extent reasonably necessary to permit the client to make informed decisions regarding the representation. So I think the lawyer did have an obligation 
to say we can go in and argue for a true common lands or we can argue for a tenancy in common, which do you want to do? Here's the pros and cons of both. If the lawyer would have done that, the lawyer would have satisfied their ethical obligation. Um, this is interesting, 16201, Rule 16201, um, a lawyer may refer not only to law but to other considerations such as moral, economic, social, and political. Would it have made a socioeconomic difference to the grantees whether it was a true common lands or a tenancy in common? Yes, it would have made a huge socioeconomic difference to them in terms of them being able to hold on to their common lands, whether it was one or the other. And the committee commentary says, advice couched in narrow legal terms may be of little value to a client, especially where practical considerations are predominant. All right, so I think we can suggest that there may have been a problem in number two, uh, right at the outset, with the fact that it was uh, confirmed as a tenancy in common and probably shouldn't have been. Um, next slide, please. You've probably heard, uh, you've probably heard about the obligation of zealous advocacy. A lawyer is supposed to be a zealous advocate uh, for their client. Um, what, what can prevent a attorney from being a zealous advocate for their client is if the attorney is also in the land business themselves. Um, and so if you know what the Santa Fe Ring is, we alluded to the Santa Fe Ring earlier in the day. The Santa Fe Ring was um, mostly lawyers, not all lawyers, but mostly lawyers who were in the land business because the land business was a very profitable business during the time that the land grants were getting confirmed. And so, um, was Napoleon Bonaparte Laughlin in the land business? Well, yes. <laughs> we can see that he, uh, he negotiated for an undivided interest, he sold, or he filed a partition suit, and when it was sold, he bought the, he bought the land grant. He bought his client's land grant at the partition suit. So yes, um, that, that falls short of the zealous protection of the client's interest. Okay, um, next slide. A lot of people think of conflict of interest being where you represent two clients like the earlier, like a number one, where A.B. Renhan re represented both the buyer and the seller in the same lawsuit. That's crazy. Um, but conflict of interest under, under the rules can also occur where there's a conflict with the personal interests of the lawyer. So a, cur a concurrent conflict of interest exists if there is a significant risk that the representation of their client will be material limited by the personal interests of the lawyer. Um, so here's a question. If there is a concurrent conflict of interest, like in this case, because there's a interest of the lawyer, because the lawyer is actually interested in the land grant, um, can the lawyer represent the client? Not without a Very good. The answer, surprisingly, is yes. The lawyer can, if. Next slide, please. It says, permissible representation when current, concurrent conflict exists, even though there's a current conflict of interest, the lawyer may represent the client if the lawyer reasonably believes that the lawyer will be able to provide competent, intelligent representation, and skip down to number four, if each affected client gives informed consent, confirmed in writing. Now, how many people think, in this case, that Napoleon Butler Laughlin gave in, or uh, provided enough information for the clients to have informed co consent. Like if the lawyer were to have done their job, they would have said, you know, we could, um, uh, you're paying me in an undivided interest, and so I um, am probably going to, if we win confirmation, I'm going to partition, and that's going to result in the land getting sold out, sold out from under you all. Uh, is this acceptable to you? How many people would have said, yes, I'll sign on the dotted line? Um, I don't think that happened. I don't think that happened. So 
It was a conflict of interest, yes, because of the personal interest of the lawyer, but the lawyer could have uh, tried to get informed consent. My guess is that they, he would not have gotten informed consent because no one would have agreed if they would have really known what was about to happen, which again, going back to the obligation of informing, um, you know, providing full information about the case and the objectives of the, of, of the client, um, if he had done that, they wouldn't have uh, bought into it. Okay, next one. Okay, it actually, there's actually a rule, 16108, I think it's I or L, no, I can't tell, I believe it's I. Um, the lawyer is not allowed to buy, an in, is not allowed to acquire an interest in the subject matter of the litigation. So if the subject matter of the litigation is land, the lawyer is not supposed to acquire an interest in it. Now can a lawyer uh, find a technical argument? Maybe. It says the lawyer shall not acquire propriety interest in the cause of action, subject matter of litigation, except that the lawyer may contract with the client for a reasonable contingent fee in a civil case. Maybe the lawyer would say, well, you know what, that 40%, that was my contingent fee. Now, I think the contingent fee in this case means money. And it, so it means that you, you can, which many lawyers do, right? Personal injury lawyers will take a fee on a contingency fee basis and say, if you win, I get 30% of the award for your injury. This rule is saying you can do that. There's nothing you can't do. But does that apply to land? I think that's arguable. Um, so lawyers aren't supposed to do what happened. Now, there's a practical problem that we talked about earlier. If you can't pay the lawyer and land, and if you need the lawyer, going back to your question, if you actually need the lawyer to secure confirmation, then what do you do? So, um, uh, next slide, please. How are we doing on time? <clears throat> okay. Um, so, this is, um, this is duties to foreign, uh, former clients. So even if, if a lawyer was to say, well, I represented you and I got confirmation of your land grant. Now that's over and you're a former client. You still have duties to a former client. Um, would a partition suit, would filing a partition suit be a violation of, of these duties? Um, you're not supposed to thereafter represent another person in the same or substantially related matter in which that person's interests are materially adverse to the interests of the former client. Well, you're representing yourself in a partition suit, as a plaintiff in a partition suit, and your interests are materially adverse to the interest because your clients don't want the common lines to get sold. And you're filing a lawsuit that will have exactly that, that effect, and you know it, and you want it, because you want to bid for it. So I would say there's a chance that 16109 um, is violated. Again, you can, you can get you informed consent from the client, but you have to really inform them what's going to happen. You're, remember, you understand the law. Your client doesn't necessarily. Your job as a lawyer is to really say, this is what, how the law applies to your situation, your problem. If your objective is to win confirmation of your land grant and keep your land base, then you know, have I done my job if I don't tell you what comes next after confirmation and how your land base is going to get sold out from under you? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> next slide. Oh, I just threw this in here. In the first place, it's not uncommon, it wasn't uncommon for the fees to be anywhere from a third to half of the land grant. Um, so that's a lot. Um, but here's, here's a tricky question. If you, <laughs> if you collected your fee, going back to slide six, If you collected your fee 
which is 40%. Um, but, what the, but what your clients actually paid was 100% because they lost their uh, because they lost their common lands. Have you collected an, uh, an unreasonable or unfair fee? I don't know, that's a theory. All right. Um, so, num I, number two, I, I specifically contrasted number one and number two. Number one, there's a lot of blatant uh, misconduct things like bribing and representing both sides of, of litigation. That's very blatant. But number, but number two is something that was considered very normal for an attorney to do, to represent the client, um, to negotiate a fee as an undivided fractional interest of the land grant, to file a partition suit, and not necessarily that you would be the buyer, but oftentimes uh, an attorney was the buyer. The very attorney who was representing the, the land grant ended up um, being the buyer. So even in what was considered kind of a normal thing, there uh, you can see that there's uh, three or four or five uh, ethical lapses um, that happened. So, what um, what would happen if in the territorial period in the period where the land grants were being confirmed and partitioned, if a lawyer got caught uh, doing something like this? So we have an example with uh, a person named A. B. Renahan who you saw in the first one. And what did A.B. Renahan do? Um, well, hang on. We'll, we'll come back to A.B. Renahan in, in a second. Um, the, let's, let's ask this question. How could this have been avoided? How could the land-grant heirs have gotten the legal services that they felt they needed and this, had, and this whole thing with the partition had been avoided. Can anyone think of a way that could happen? Well, here's a hint. Who says that the attorney's fee has to be an undivided share mixed in with the others? Who says that that had to be the case? No, right? It didn't have to be the case. How could the attorney have gotten paid instead in land? What's, what's, what's not an undivided share? It's carving the land grant up into 40% and carving a specific piece of 40% of the land and saying, this is your land. If the attorney would have gotten paid that way, the attorney's share would not have been mixed in, the attorney would not have been a co-tenant, the attorney couldn't have used the partition statute to cause the sale. Okay, why didn't that happen? Why? We don't know. We all we know is that attorneys wanted their share to be an undivided share, and if you look at the the their surviving documents that show uh, lawyer retainer agreements, and they almost always say as an undivided thirty percent, an undivided forty percent, undivided fifty percent. So that just set things up for the disaster of partitioning to happen, but it didn't have to be that way. Was it ever not done that way? Um, the answer is yes. Next slide. Or I'm sorry, slide 15. So with the Juan Jose Lovato grant, the attorney who helped them, the Juan Jose Lovato grant, um, get confirmation, his name was George Hill Howard. And he negotiated his share to be 50%, but 50% of a uh, not undivided share. So he got the northern half of the Juan Jose Lovato grant as his fee. And he won confirmation, and he, and, um, and he couldn't sue for, for partition because he got a specific piece of land, and he negotiated that um, purposely. And in fact, um, he did another service for the land grant later, and he got paid with a quarter of the southern half of the land grant. Um, but that was also set aside and not an undivided share. So in both cases, he got paid in a way that didn't lead to partition. Um, and so um, 
By the way, I don't, I don't know if people are familiar with it, but Juan was able to to grant the Rio Chama and the highway, kind of go through it, add a few reservoirs here. This is the highest peak in the Hemis Range, down there at the bottom, that's Chicoma Peak, and uh, El Rito is here in the northern half of the grant. And within the Juan Jose Lovato grant are three other grants, including the, including the Abiquiu grant, grant in the village of Abiquiu. So this was a huge grant, 205,000 acres, uh, so he did, he did pretty well for himself. Um, but anyways, there's another, um, well, let's see, I'm trying to see what the next, okay. So there's, uh, next slide, please. There is such a thing, if you know to ask the court for it, as it's called the remedy of allotment. It's a, it's a remedy that applies to partition suits. And allotment means where certain parties ask the court to exclude their shares from the sale. So in other words, going back to <laughs> slide six. In other words, someone could file a, uh, the attorney could, file a partition suit, say I'm the, I'm the uh, petitioner, I'm sorry, I'm the plaintiff, and either one of the defendants or the plaintiff could come in and say, you know, um, let's carve out, you know, kind of the same thing, let's carve out 40% and let's um, sell that, and the other 60% we're just gonna keep as a block and it won't become part of the sale. So you can ask the court to do that, but. It, it never happened in New Mexico. Why didn't it happen? We don't know, but you would have had to, A, be participating in the suit, and so many times people didn't have notice, didn't get served, and weren't participating in the suit, and B, you would have to know enough about the law. Who was gonna tell you the, about the law? Was it gonna be your former attorney who's filing for partition? Probably, that's something that your attorney probably should have told you at some point. Um, as part of the informed consent, is I'm gonna file for partition if you go through with this, and but you have the right to ask for a, an allotment, and that way your land can't get sold. It doesn't seem to have happened. It doesn't seem to have happened. Uh, but the remedy was there. Please, back to slide 16. Thank you so much, Lauren, sorry about this. Um, the New Mexico partition statute didn't exist expressly provide for allotment, but it could have been raised by any party. Um, the court might have been sympathetic to that because they, the court might have said, you know what, this partition suit is being filed by an attorney because the attorney wants to extract their share. Let the attorney extract their share. Keep the rest of it intact for the, uh, the, for the remaining members of the community. So it's, I would say it probably was likely that if someone would have raised the remedy of allotment that would have gotten granted by the court, but we don't have any record that it was ever raised. Um, and the grantees without an attorney and without an understanding of these aspects of the law probably weren't even uh, aware, aware of that remedy. So, next slide. Um, so, how would lawyering, just to recap, how would lawyering have been done in compliance with the ethics rules is that the lawyer could have negotiated with the clients for a fixed tract of land rather than as than for an undivided fraction, which would have led to partition, or the lawyer um, could have pleaded that the other interests be set aside as allotments and set aside from the sale. And so the only known record of it was the one Jose Lovato where they did number one. Okay, so back to Slide 15. How are we doing for time? I want to leave 10 minutes. Okay, uh, 14 minutes left. 14 minutes and then there'll be 10? No, four minutes. Four and minutes, then okay, be four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so what happens when someone gets caught? So what did A.B. Renahan do? What A.B. Renahan did and it, this had to do with the Juan Jose Lovato grant, is um, he was, um, the heirs um, wanted to sell their share of the southern half. 
And, um, and so it was auctioned and there was a buyer and the buyer was a company in Colorado. And so A.B. Ranahan represented, was hired by the company who bought it in Colorado. And what A.B. Ranahan said was, I'm, I'll, I'll find a way, you're, you're wanting to pay $24,000 for this uh, chunk of land. I'll find a way, company, for, that you won't have to pay so much. So A.B. Ranahan went, um, so there was, if you remember, there's like a referee or a trustee as part of the partition suit. So the trustee no, knew that the um, sale price was $24,000 and it was going to be up to the trustee to collect that money and then distribute it to each of the heirs in accordance with their fractional share that they owned. What A.B. Ranahan said he would do and what he did is he went to the heirs now remember, he was hired by the company, and he said, you know that trustee? You can't trust that trustee. That trustee is going to take so long, and that trustee has no intention of giving you all your money. I'll, I'll get your money for you, and I'll get your money for you right away. Um, and he had them sign something called an assignment, where they were assigning their share to him, and he was going to give them cash right away. The only problem was, if you added up the assignments, they didn't add up to $24,000, they added up to a lot less. So he got people to sign over the, uh, their share for less than what he knew the full amount to be. He knew what the full amount was and how it got divided up fractionally. And then he um, turned around and, and told the company, see, I've now got all, all the shares of this thing that you want to buy for less than, uh, than $24,000. So he did that and he got caught. And he was brought before the Board of Bar Examiners and he was brought before the New Mexico Supreme Court um, as to whether he should be disbarred or not. And so this is a reported case. Um, oh, I don't have the citation with me. But anyways, um, the court said a number of things. The court did not disbar him. The court said, how could 50 people not know that there was a difference between what they were entitled to and what they signed the assignment for? The court said, um, well, you know, some of these people were his clients, but other of these people, he was just uh, acting as a businessman, not a lawyer, and he owes them no duty. And um, that this type of thing doesn't constitute a danger to the legal profession, and to society in the same way as if he did it to a client. Um, yeah, what's that? What is that? I think he was. I think he was. Um, the court said, you know, Renahan, you really should have reduced this to writing because you're saying one thing and they're saying another and it makes it hard for us to know who's telling the truth. Um, and if you, but we don't think anything you did rose to the level that you would be subject to the humiliation of getting your license taken away. Um, they even said, this is the funniest part of the decision, um, they said, you know, not every lawyer has the same moral compass. Some don't have much of one, and some have a good one, and we should all strive to have a good one. Um, the thing I, I didn't like about it is, I, I don't think they, they, I don't think the court really addressed the fact that he went and said, oh, thank you, that he went and actually told the people that this trustee is gonna screw you, and uh, therefore, trust me, um, kind of thing. They didn't, uh, because, you know, there was no evidence at all that that was true, and so he was inducing them by causing causing people to fear that they weren't going to get their money um, to sign these assignments. And the court also didn't address the fact that um, that he was initially the company's attorney, going and talking to unrepresented people. Um, you have there's a lot of ethical uh, in, under a modern day analysis. There's a lot of ethical implications when you talk to um, an unrepresented party. Um, that you're not actually creating a lawyer-client relationship by telling them what's in their best interest. And that they can say, hey, I thought he was my lawyer. 
you actually, when you talk to an unrepresented party, that's a very dangerous thing for you to do as a lawyer. Um, if it's contrary to your client's interest in any way, you have to say, hey, I want to be clear, I'm representing the company. You probably should get your own legal advice as to whether to do this or not. I am not your lawyer. Um, and we don't think, I mean, I'm pretty sure Renham didn't, didn't do any of those things. So in other words, um, he got away with it. One more thing really quick, because I know we don't have time, is that the only other one that is in the, um, in the record is Catherine. Thomas Catherine himself got brought before the Supreme Court for a disbarment for witness tampering in a murder case. Um, and uh, he got off also. But there was a long dissent, um, really long dissent, where they really went through the evidence of what Catherine did and why he should have been disbarred. And um, it was a one dissent out of three judges. And the one dissent was who? It was Napoleon Bonaparte Laughlin. So Laughlin didn't like it when Catherine was unethical, but he didn't have any problems with himself being unethical, I guess. That's all I have. If, you, if there's any questions, thank you. Question. So um, is it ethical uh, for an attorney to not review uh, deeds in a courthouse that are involved in a case, whether it's land grant or private property or home? Um, did everyone hear that question? Yes. Is it ethical for it? Uh, to, to not review, to ignore deeds that are registered? Or yeah, and, not, and I'm not quite sure whether you're talking about like uh, finding something that is important to the case because that gets into malpractice, which is a civil thing. Uh, if you commit, well, there is a duty of competence that's in the ethical rules, but the thing that lawyers who uh, neglect to properly prepare for their case have more to worry about is that they could be sued for malpractice and, you know, that's, that can be a lot of money. Yes? The ethical rules that you're talking about here, when were they instituted? Um, that's a good question. The, the, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if any law professors here might know that. I know that when these cases happened like in, uh, against Renahan and against Catherine, there was, um, there was an understood set of rules and there were treatises that had been written about what ethical obligations were. And what the judges would do in these cases is they would refer to these treatises um, but then they wouldn't always follow them. They would say, well, you know, we think that this is more like a criminal case, and since he said this and Catherine said that, um, there's not enough evidence, and it's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt kind of thing. And they were kind of making up things uh, and not necessarily following the treatises. Nowadays, the ethical rules, and I don't know if anyone here would know when they were first incorporated. Anyone, Jesus, do you know? I think it was relatively recent. Okay. In 1960. Right. Okay. Uh, gentleman in front. Are there any uh, statute of limitations now? Why can't these injustices that the U.S. government and their attorneys did now we understand what happened? What's to stop us from remedying all these injustices now? Arturo, what's the answer to that question? I'm just kidding. I don't mean to, they're cute. Yeah, we have the question. What's to stop us from, now that we know what happened and what rules were violated, or what obligations were violated, what can we do? <laughs> can you help me answer that? Yeah. <laughs> just, I, I, I think people are going to get tired of hearing me talk, so someone else should. It's the reality. It's the reality. Um, there was, I'm sorry, I, I'm going to go back and forth. Uh, the woman in the red in the middle. And so that was part of my question. He, he asked part of my question, but to couple that with, you indicated something really interesting, and that it was uh, a violation in 
terms of the bilingual, there was no way to really address the issue that people were not really getting notified. Only people who could read, you know, the English language were being notified. And so because of that, and coupling his question with my question with the answer, isn't there now something in civil rights that can handle that? I, I think if there were, we were up for trying it. Now, in, um, in number one, the Trump situation, notice that there was uh, uh, something bad that happened early on with the sale of the granite partition, and then a decade later, the lum lumber company um, settled a quiet title suit, and there was a whole another set of misconduct that happened. Why did the lumber company file for a quiet title suit if they had bought the land of the partition sale? The answer is because there were two cases in the New Mexico Supreme Court, Priest versus City of Las Vegas and La Cueva Ranch versus something else, um, that had to do with quiet title suits and partition suits that said that thing where you just uh, are lazy and you don't um, serve people with papers who you know have an interest in the grant, but you just say, oh, un un unknown heirs, and you publish it, the court in New Mexico said you can't do that anymore. So what the lumber company worried about is that they had gotten the land at a partition sale where that very thing happened. And they felt like they had to file a quiet title suit because now someone would come back and do exactly what they said. And in the quiet title suit, they were much more uh, assiduous about uh, serving everyone and in fact getting everyone to sign those use, those use agreements and kind of thing. So there was, a, there was some uh, improvement in the case law um, with regard to that, to prevent that from happening after, I can't remember when priests in La Cueva were 1910 or something like that. Um, and we're almost out of time, but I'll take one more. Yes? Do you think that the Heirs Act is an appropriate for any grants held You know what, do you mind just yeah. removing, just for a second, yeah. Do you think the Heirs Act is an appropriate legal recourse for any grants held What is the Heirs Act? Okay, so um, the question is, where is the New Mexico Heirs Act helpful for this? Would you like to take the microphone and <laughs> say sure. a little bit about well, it? Well, I, I actually... Uh, I, I came from Virginia, and we have just passed this, and I noticed you all passed it in 2017. But it is a legal recourse for heirs, um, especially in land held in Tennessee, to go back to titles and deeds, and if there is no notification, then the courts can re-see these cases and re revisit the cases with all the errors recognized. Wow. So is that for the state? Is that the state of New Mexico. I, uh, uh, I read it. It was apparently passed in 2017. What year? 2017. What's the name of that? The New Mexico Errors Act, H-E-I-R-S. But we're using it in Virginia to um, revisit black communities um, later in Tennessee. So African American communities, similar uh, land is held in Tennessee. So uh, just this is interesting. Give an example of a situation where where this. Sure. Could help. So often, like a plantation would um, give land to um, their now freed slaves, and it would be held in Tennessee, and it would become a black community. And uh, very often, land developers would come in, similar to these attorneys and represent cases and pretty much take the land away from black black and African American communities. There's a case uh, ongoing now in California that's called Bruce's Beach. And uh, Bruce just signed a law restoring property back to the family of, of an African American uh, line that uh, had their had their property confiscated by the town and uh, declared as uh, you know back taxes. So Thank you for that, for those, uh, and I'm going to have to close it there, but if anyone has any questions, come on up and I'd be happy to, to answer your questions. I, I saw you, but... <laughs> So, that's right. The rules of civil procedure allow you to reopen a case within a, within a reasonable period of time. Um, oh, thank you, thank you. 1987. Thanks, everyone.